I'd like to thank you all for coming to uh, this lecture today and your class for um, practicing Islam, challenges and prospects for Muslims living in turbulent Sri Lanka by Dr. B.A. Hassan Mia. Recent events in Sri Lanka have brought about a period of political instability on the island nation. Once touted to become another prosperous Singapore, Sri Lanka is currently in the throes of political anarchy, made worse by the near collapse of social and economic structures. Many reasons are attributed to the current social upheaval in Sri Lanka, not the least of which is the callous disregard by the majoritarian rulers for the travails of religious and linguistic minorities, such as the Tamils and the Muslims. This talk will explore issues of history, ethnicity, and contributions of Muslims in Sri Lanka, and how their status has recently deteriorated in a majoritarian polity that is pushing Sri Lanka into a current anarchic state. So Dr. Hussein Mia is a current Fulbright Scholar in residence in the Religious Studies Department at FIU. He's an author and historian of Asia and has written extensively on Brunei Jerusalem and hence decorated by the Brunei Sultan and Sri Lankan Muslim Malays. He's been in academia for the last 50 years and has served at international universities in Sri Lanka, New Zealand, Malaysia, and Brunei. He's also active, he's also an active Islamic scholar, so, uh, sorry, social worker, and has led important youth organizations in Sri Lanka, including the Young Men's Muslim Association of Sri Lanka and the Federation of Muslim Youth Organizations in Sri Lanka. So thank you to the uh, Falzia and Muslim Jaffer Center uh, for Muslim World Studies and the co-sponsors of the Ruth K. and Shepard Broad Distinguished Lecture Series, the FIU Department of Politics and International Relations, and the FIU Department of Religious Studies for the um, wonderful and sure to be informative, uh, surely serendipitous discussion of uh, Dr. Hussainia. For 10 days in March, Sri Lanka imposed a state of emergency after fighting broke out between Buddhist and Muslim groups. The Muslim minority saw its mosques and properties scorched by Buddhist hardliners. Fighting initially broke out in Kandy after a Sinhalese truck driver died in hospital after being attacked by a small group of Muslim men. The riots quickly spread, leaving three people dead in the revenge attacks that followed. While the violence is over in Sri Lanka for now, religious tension remains high, especially when you have Sinhalese nationalist Buddhist groups like Bodubala Sena fueling the fire. TRT World's Off the Grid series gained rare access to its leader, Galagoda Athe Nyanasara, the monk who's been accused of inciting hatred against Muslims. He says he wants to protect the Sinhalese identity. He says Muslims must be stopped from taking over. Ethnic and religious tension in Sri Lanka is nothing new. But since the end of its civil war in 2009, violence between Muslims and the country's largest ethnic group, the Sinhalese, has been on the rise. Sinhalese are overwhelmingly Buddhist, and hardline groups like Bodu Balasena have grown in popularity. They're portraying Islam and Muslims as a religious, cultural, and economic threat. Yanasara has faced numerous court cases for inciting violence, and on Thursday was found guilty for assault. He will be sentenced next month. It's been a long time coming. 
four years ago, he delivered this speech in the southern town of Aluthgama. <laughs> Within hours, a group of Sinhalese nationalists went on the attack. Three people died that night, including Nawasiya's husband. <laughs> The nationalist movement has opened the way for retaliation against the Sinhalese. A day after the Aluthgama violence, Shiranti's house was among four belonging to Sinhalese that were attacked. <laughs> While the state of emergency has appeared to have quashed the renewed violence in Sri Lanka, mistrust and misunderstanding linger. And unless the government acts quickly against the perpetrators of communal violence, where will that leave the country? Christine Pirovolakis, The Newsmakers. Good afternoon. Yeah, sorry, <coughs> I, I had a bit of cold now, so you are not going to hear my real voice. <laughs> well, I deliberately made a clip for you all, just for you to understand, because you, you are American students mostly, from outside. You may not know what we are undergoing. I am a Muslim in Sri Lanka. So I'm afraid that I don't want to present a case solely from the Muslim point of view. I would like to present to you as much as possible the actual evolution of these issues because this may help you to understand your own understanding about the South Asia in general. Today, as you know, South Asia, especially India, take India and Sri Lanka, for example, have become hotbeds of ethnic disharmony. This disharmony is very deliberate. The politicians have found a very easy way of exploiting the religious and ethnic sentiments to advance their base. In other words, every politician would like to get elected to the legislature in order to run the government. And in this way, there is much comparison between what is happening in India and Sri Lanka. In India, for example, Congress set up by Jawaharlal Nehru immediately after the um, independence or even before that was ruling for a long time and they were unshakable. But an uh, opposition party called BJP um, took up its cause by advancing the interest of the Hindu majority of India. And as a result, the Hindus found an easy bait in the argument and the decade-long rule of Congress was thrown away and the BJP or Bharatiya Janata Party advancing the Hindu interest came to power. One classic example is they were wiping out the old history of this region. For example, when the Muslims came to India in the 12th, 13th centuries, they built up masjids or mosques, and they found that some of these mosques were built over the remains of the Hindu gods. And there was an incident where in a Babur Masjid was demolished, and that created a lot of communal violence. 
Well, I'm talking about Sri Lanka, but I'm going to India. I'll tell you why. It is because there's, what happens in uh, Sri Lanka has a parallel story. That point will come. Well, I don't want to uh, treat you like as if uh, people without knowledge. It's my duty to show you where Sri Lanka is. Sometime I have come across in the US, they don't know where Sri Lanka is. They don't know I'm a Sri Lankan. Sometimes they don't know that they have seen Indians also. I have had personal experience, so I think it's my duty to show you. I hope this, this um, uh, what you call global picture would indicate where Sri Lanka is. Is in the Indian Ocean, just south of India. And Sri Lanka is not India. Although a lot of uh, commonalities between India and Sri Lanka is there, but Sri Lanka is a separate uh, nation. Now this is the total picture of Sri Lanka as an island, about 25,000 uh, miles in all, surrounded an island, surrounded by sea, and very prosperous country. Uh, every uh, tourist, outsiders, particularly Westerners come there, fall in love with Sri Lanka for many reasons. One is beautiful beaches, of course, being in Florida, you don't need to worry about so much of beaches. <laughs> but in Sri Lanka too has their own attraction. But apart from that, what Sri Lanka offers is the cultural variety of history. For example, Sri Lanka has 2,500 years of history. You have got ruins belonging to the second millennium before. And it's very historic and also very scenic. There's a, in within one day, they say in Sri Lanka, you can reach four, four seasons from cold to savanna. Anyway, Sri Lanka became a hot spot for tourism for many reasons because island nation and it has been like that so now coming to the muslims most of the muslims you see this is in the northern and eastern 60 percent of them the rest of them are scattered all over sri lanka the most of the idea from the northern and uh, sri lanka well let me give you a brief description otherwise you will not understand what i'm talking about Sri Lanka is a, basically a Sinhalese nation or Buddhist nation, meaning they are the majority. Majority, I'm giving you some statistics, old statistics. 2011 is not processed yet. 69.1% Buddhism. Muslims constitute 7.6. Hindus, 7.1. Christians, 6.2. Unspecified, 10%. So this is the ethnic distribution. So you can see Sri Lanka can safely claim as a majority Buddhist Muslim country where Buddhism is a largely practicing religion and among them lives minorities i call minorities muslims and and hindus and tamils so i have given you this uh, basic composition statistic uh, in order for you to understand as think corner now it is my duty to, uh, to take you through a little bit of history the buddhism in sri lanka came 2500 years ago long ago even before christ it was in existence hinduism also same from India they came. Of course, Islam came after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, Islam started spreading in Sri Lanka in about 900 to 10, 10 AD. So Sri Lanka, Hindu Islam, comparatively, very uh, younger religion in uh, Sri Lanka. Of course, Christianity came. As you know, Christianity is, is spread by the uh, colonialist. And in Sri Lanka was under the rule of the Portuguese first, 1505, and it was followed by Dutch, and finally the British ruled Sri Lanka, and we gained independence in 1948. So this gives you the total, very brief, historical evolution of the country, how religions have uh, come in. Now, the issue in Sri Lanka is not very uh, unique. The what happens in Sri Lanka has happened in elsewhere. For example, the enterprising minorities in most plural societies invariably become the target of anger and envy from the majority community whenever the, those societies' economy and polity come under the internal and external pressures. Recent experiences of Indians in Burma, Fiji in Africa, and Chinese in Malaysia and Indonesia are a few of many examples of this phenomena. So technically, that is what happens to Sri Lanka, the Muslims are generally considered a business community. In the historically, um, 
they were very ubiquitous. The Sinhalese people were large agriculturist. Of course, there was a little bit of uh, business involved, but wherever uh, Muslims went, like the Chinese in Malaysia, uh, they became uh, businessmen, meaning it was a necessary part of supporting the society, like providing transport, providing um, uh, rural supplies. Thirdly, most important, what we don't understand is, during the most part of the Sinhalese rule, in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, the Sinhalese rulers relied upon the Muslims to carry on their work, such as trade, as I told you once. Secondly, they were their foreign ministers, meaning when the Sinhalese kings tried to contact, make contacts with India and other countries, it was the Muslim scribes who conducted their affairs. Third most important thing is, the Muslims were good, uh, what you call, medical people. They were doctors, native doctors. They treated the local kings. In fact, if you know the history of this region, one of the reasons why Islam spread so fast in Maldives, in Malaysia, was because of the medical services and the spiritual services provided by the Muslims to the local rulers. They were very impressed by the conduct of the Muslims because of their purity and uh, their expertise in various uh, fields of knowledge which was not available to the indigenous people. So that is how Islam became very popular in the early, early period. So basically what I am arguing is in the normal period, historical period, Muslims and the Sinhalese, the majority, lived, I will say, rather in good harmony. There was no issue. People did not treat themselves as separate people. They, they had a very symbiotic relationship. Muslims depended on the Sinhalese, Sinhalese depended on the Muslims. That was how the history was all the time. But it took a, a turn for the reasons I am going to show you now. Yes, what happened when the British came, the British provided equal opportunities to many people. They protected all these communities. And uh, although Sri Lanka was a Buddhist country, the British equally gave importance to the other communities. But they did not uh, make any distinction about these things. This is what happened. When the British did the same in Malaysia, Indonesia, sorry, in India, but the problem with the British is they were equitable, just people, fair, fair people, uh, Western models and Western standards. And they treated all equally. Sometimes it may not be right. The Bhumiputras mean the people who are born in the country need to be little cared than the other people. So during the British period, this was not an issue. But however, the first major riot in Sri Lanka occurred against the Muslims in the year 1915. That's a time when the Muslims from India, coastal India, came to Sri Lanka to set up businesses. And they created the ire of the Sinhalese in the coastal areas that Muslims are ubiquitous and dominating the business. So they were very jealous of them. And at that time, there was already a new revivalist movement that started among the Sinhalese already, the British period. They wanted to recreate their glory. And uh, they wanted Buddhism to take the pride of place in the country's national life. And uh, this was advocated by some of the serious uh, Buddhist nationalists, like a guy called Anagarika Tarbapala, a very famous man. He was utterly anti-Muslim. Anti-Muslim in the sense, not the Muslims, he said. It was the coastal mosque or the Indian Muslims who came to Sri Lanka to set up Muslims. They set up the starter. So there was a major riot during the British period in 1915, the first riot. However, it was suppressed. And the British actually caught the rioters, mostly Sinhalese, the chief chieftains of Sinhalese, and they hung them for destroying the national unity. That psyche has gone into the minds of the Sinhalese at that time, 1915. They were very angry that they couldn't do anything because it was not their country. It was under the British, so British could do anything what they want. As I said, British believed in fair play. So 
the suffering was by the majority. So they kept it to the mind. And now come independence. Sri Lanka became 1948 independence. Now you can see the whole hell will break loose, just like India. Now, once independence, the Sri Lankan polity, Sri Lankan government is taken over naturally by the majority people. That is the Sinhalese Buddhist. The same thing in Malaysia. The Malay people, majority, they take over. In India, Hindus take over. So under these circumstances, they were not tolerant about many concessions Muslims still started enjoying. One of them is Muslims began to enter professions and started education. Throughout history, Muslims did not want to follow Western education. They did not want English education provided by the colonial people because they thought it was a ploy to convert them into Christianity. And the Muslims were having this kind of adopted, this attitude uh, in many areas where they lived, especially in India. So they were afraid of the Western education and therefore they remained backward educationally. And they could not enter areas of uh, professional professionalism due to that. But in 1970, something else happened. A Muslim minister became the education minister of the country called Badiuddin Muhammad. He started opening up schools and uh, employed Muslims, teachers, to extra education. And that was a change among the Muslim attitude. And they, they started now beginning to take the national uh, idea of learning education. And they were slowly becoming doctors and engineers. That, the single thought, they are getting special treatment. And then, from 1970s, there were a lot of attacks on the Muslims, in a minor, minor way, not in the way I'm talking. And uh, now we are coming to 1980s to 2009. 2009. This is the period the Muslim phobia swept throughout the country. When I talk about Muslims, I am not mentioning to you another part of Sri Lankan history. You know about the Tamil people. Tamils had been fighting for their homeland, north and east, and uh, there was a war going on. In 1983, 1983, there was a major riot in which many Tamils died. Their properties were put to fire, and uh, they lost a lot of uh, their livelihood. Their businesses were closed. So from 1983 onwards, the Sri Lankan Tamils and the Sinhalese Buddhist was in a confrontational mode. And from that year until 2009, they had been conducting wars. The Tamil people from the north conducted quite a lot of terrorist activities. Terrorism was the key word of that period. They So much so, they killed Sri Lankan Prime Minister. And very important intellectuals of Sri Lanka, not only that, they even killed Rajiv Gandhi, the Indian Prime Minister, who was trying to negotiate between the Tamils and the um, Sinhalese. So that was a period, very bad period, in which there was a clash between Tamils and Sinhalese. I'm not talking about Muslims now. Now, during that period, Muslims had a respite, because they were going against the Tamils minority, the Muslim minorities at that time kept a middle path. They did not want to side either party, Tamils or Sinhalese. But the Tamils did a, did a very nasty thing to them. They expelled them from their territories, Muslims. They became uh, refugees from their own country. They lived there more than four, five hundred years. Now Muslims became refugees and they had to move out. But despite so, they did not want to take side. Of course, they were quite, what you call, um, amenable to the Sinhalese people, although they did not want to fight the Tamils on behalf of the Sinhalese. So that was the story up to 83. Now come 83, after 83 and 2009, the Tamil Tiger Movement was defeated. As you know, there was a very famous leader called Prapagaran. He was supposed to be the leader of the Tamil Elam or Tamil country. He was such a great warrior 
and uh, he conducted good warfare and make a threat to the Sinhalese nation and the Sinhalese people. But 2009, he was defeated, he was killed. And the whole Sri Lankan history changed after that. So what the Tamil suffered, now Muslims are going to suffer. That is the next part of my talk. So, with the military defeat of the LTT, LTT mean liberation, tigers of Tamil Elam. They are known as very famous people. One of the world's most fierce uh, army, liberation army. Unfortunately, they, they had to lose. And uh, her hysterical fear about the Tamil community, nurtured over centuries by nationalistic historians and Sinhalese politicians, finally seems to have evaporated from the Sinhalese psyche. And the idea that Sri Lanka is for Sinhala Buddhist and for Buddhism only, with limited tolerance for other religions and ethnic groups, as so eloquently articulated by nationalist leaders like Dharmapala in the early years. So what happens is, we have to understand the majority mind, Sinhalese. If you know, Tamil people, Tamil, they are world over. They are everywhere in the country, like Chinese. But Sinhalese are generally confined to Sri Lanka. They are the they are confined to Sri Lanka, meaning that they consider Sri Lanka is the only country where they have refuge. And historically, they have their chronicle called Mahavangsa, which is the historical rule in which it's very clearly stated that Buddhism would survive in Sri Lanka. So therefore, it is the duty of the Sinhalese to protect their religion and country and to make their identity. So that is why uh, the mentality of total commitment to their religion and language have now becoming manifested in their hatred towards other communities. So, I'm trying to say the, the Sri Lanka was known as Sihala Dweepa or the Sinhalese island and in the Sinhalese island it is, they must make all the necessary arrangements to see that Buddhism and Sinhalese is preserved. Now, where do the Muslims stand against this? They have no objection. They have no problem. Muslims have no problem. Sri Lanka going Sinhalese way, Buddhist way. But all what they wanted was a need to have coexistence. For them to carry on their life traditionally assigned to them from the Sinhalese kings. They did not have any problems with the majority people, as such, never. So they wanted the same status quo to continue throughout. But that was never to be. Why? Now this is where I'm coming to the last part of my talk. This is very important for students like you. How ethnicity, ethnicity and politics becomes a bad mixture in bringing down the entire nation if you don't manage the ethnicity properly. Today, I don't know how many of you are aware, Sri Lanka is in a deep trouble. They were nearly anarchy about two months back. The government was supposed to collapse, withering of the state. There was a big uprising by the people of Sri Lanka. People of Sri Lanka. And if that has succeeded, Sri Lanka would be, I think, in my view, will be like another, uh, what do you call, um, Cambodia. You know what happened in Cambodia under Pol Pot? Pol Pot, the Cambodians finally got rid of the state, got rid of the political parties and set up their own local government things, which is very harsh, nasty and harsh. For example, just to give an extra example, professors like us will never be able to teach. We were sent forcefully to plow the fields, to plant paddies. They said, these are useless people. What are they talking about history and geography? These people have to work in reality. They have to produce food, go back. And then they gave importance to people, ordinary people who worked on it. In other words, we are talking as a political scientist, a withering of the state, withering of the system. In Sri Lanka, it was nearly taking place just about two, three months back. The only difference is in Sri Lanka, for some reason, the police and army did not go go to the side of the people. They, they protected the parties. They protected the parliamentarians. And now there was a terrible coup 
against the whole movement. Now, why I am talking about this? Is this brought about by the anti-Muslim sentiment? Or does it mean that this mismanaging of ethnicity is leading to this kind of uh, what you call uh, withering of the state in Sri Lanka? Now, that is what now I am trying to find a link between these two. How important it is to, to manage a country despite the fact that it's a majority, how do they integrate, accommodate the, the other groups in the country for a common good, for a common good? Because what is the station nation for? The basically, we have to look after the security of the people. Security in the sense, food security. They must have food, they must be able to live normally. But what happened recently in Sri Lanka, the entire system collapsed. The economy collapsed, and hardly anything left in the treasury. Imagine 22 million people has to work, wait in the queues to put petrol in their cars, and they have no gas. And it was a, all hell got broke loose. The people suffered. Even today, they say about 3.3 million people in Sri Lanka are on the starvation level. Poverty has increased. And today's news is that even the world is undergoing depression. America is undergoing recession. And how are these countries are going to stand up? But why this is happening? This is the important question uh, I need to answer. One is, the, what is the role of the Muslims in this game? In fact, I will say, my Muslim brothers will not uh, agree with me. The Muslims overplayed their card. Muslims are very conservative people. They wanted to only protect their religion and protect themselves just like Buddhists did it. In the process, what happened? In the 1970s, there was this process of Arabization in Sri Lanka. Arabization. Arabization means the, the Sri Lankan women who were previously dressed like the local, local people started wearing chador and started wearing dark, dark, this thing dress to distinguish themselves as Muslims. That really distinguished the normal Sinhalese from the Muslims. If you go into one of the Muslim universities in Sri Lanka, you will see whether you'll be wondering whether they have come to Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. There, all the girls are wearing only dark, long, black dress, which means that the so-called uh, Arabization, Arabic morals were put to them. And they fell trapped to some of the things happening, especially the, after the Iranian revolution. Iranians and Arabs were very much active in propagating the ideology in Sri Lanka. And some of the extreme movements fell trapped to that. And then they started promoting the Arab way of living, Arab way of thinking into Sri Lanka. Not only that, Muslims received quite a lot of funds from Arab countries to put up the mosque. And if you come to Sri Lanka, you'll be surprised. You will not see that sometimes it's a Buddhist country. Everywhere you see mosque. Every town you'll see Muslim mosque, as if it's a Muslim country. And still they were building. And all this irritated. So now, high time, the backlash started doing it. That's what happened in the recent past. Now, I just showed you a clip where a Buddhist monk we call Buddhist Bodhu Bala Sena. Bodhu Bala means Bo Buddha's warriors. They started now attacking directly the Muslim interest. One of the way of attacking Muslim interest is Muslims were naturally they were having halal food. They can't do halal food. They tried to ban halal in Sri Lanka. And most importantly. Muslims in Sri Lanka enjoyed their own personal laws, like marriage laws, Sharia laws, within their family system, and it, uh, assurance given by the British. What the uh, Sinhalese Buddhist extremists found, the Muslims are having an easy way. When a Muslim man can marry only one wife, Muslim man can, sorry, single man can marry one wife, Muslims can marry four wives. Plus, that, that system allowed Girls about 12 after puberty to get married. And this irritated the major Sinhalese people. 
So now they started directly attacking the Muslims. Firstly, stop building masjids. Second, don't spread your Islamic education like madrasas. Sri Lanka has more than 3,000 madrasas. That is, madrasa means religious teaching conducted to the Muslims. Third, their marriage laws. So all these things came under scrutiny and under attack. The so Muslims now took a back seat. It's a very serious matter. Whenever Muslims try to resist that, it will lead into riots, just like what we saw. So the misunderstanding and the anti-Muslim sentiments was made to spread throughout by the modern social media on top of it. So Sri Lanka now, therefore, was caught in the, in the heavy crossfire of these cultural conflicts, and the Muslims became part of it. Now, one of the reasons why Muslims could not integrate with the Sinhalese society was, as you know, the Buddhists were iconocast trusts, meaning they worship idols, whereas Muslims belong to the Ahlul Kitab, or the people of the books, so they cannot go together. So therefore, they always kept apart from the Buddhist. For example, Buddhist men won't wash their urines. So Muslims men are very Puritan in that sense. So therefore, these two cultures cannot meet together. But that, that itself created a lot of problem later. The Muslims' isolationism, Muslim conservatism, could not anymore last in the face of direct attacks on their community. And mind you, from 1980s up to 2004, there were so many incidents of riots in Sri Lanka. Easy way, the Muslim mosques were the targets. Muslim businesses were targets. As you say, as I said earlier, why businesses target that simple jealousy? But why, why is the politics here? Now, this is, I think I should come to the last part of my talk. In Sri Lanka, after 70s and 80s, there was this party. They promoted Buddhism vis-a-vis -vis other religions. And then by promoting Buddhism and by, by by insulting other religions, they were able to gather enough support to their thing. But that really made things worse. And mind you, if the politicians were innocent, if the politicians were direct, if the politicians had some kind of decency, then this problem won't happen. Unfortunately or fortunately, Sri Lankan politicians became so corrupt. Every, every little government contracts every politician will take shares. Throughout the period, Sri Lankan uh, treasury getting depleted by, by promoting unnecessary, uh, what you call, infrastructure. Like, for example, they will go and build a cricket stadium in the jungle. They will go and build a huge, uh, what you call, conference hall in a place where nobody would go. Why? Because the money was borrowed from countries like China, they give them a higher rate, and they use the money for their pocket. But they, for lies, they create some kind of image. So basically what happened over a period of time, Sri Lankan politicians, due to the structural system, was becoming corrupt day by day. And it has been going on from the day of independence. So now when I came to this country in January, I came. Uh, very reasonable country. Prices were there, I can get petrol, I could take a flight out, everything. But now I am afraid, when I go back at the end of the month, I am going to a totally different Sri Lanka. The prices have doubled, tripled. I don't know how I will handle it. In other words, I don't want to go into the details about the corruption. Basically, Sri Lanka has become a corrupt country. I am not saying this. Even IMF yesterday said, all the people, don't come to ask for funds. First, clean up your stables. First, clean up your politics. Third, make things work. But I think it's very rough, tough. 
the Sri Lankans have got used to this corruption and uh, bad way of handling money. And they're very, what I would call it, uh, very uh, self-centered people. They did not care about the other people. So what happens is, over a period of time, due to bad management, bad management of the finances and the treasury, what happened? Sri Lanka became bankrupt. I, I mean bankrupt. I was told, I think yesterday I was listening to a museum, um, the news, that we only have 300 million to spend. Imagine 300 million. In America, they give billion to, where? To other countries. Here we have 300 million to manage to uh, 22 million people. So you can understand the concept. It's very difficult to reconstruct once the corruption uh, system goes in. And uh, this is where there's a huge movement for the country to emerge. Now, where does Muslims come in? Now, Muslims also now into this. In the 1980s, Muslims formed their own political parties. In Sri Lankan political system, there were only two major parties, major Sinhalese parties. But 1985, Muslims found the taste from the Eastern province. They created their own parties, but they were successful. In their own parties, because of the electoral system of proportional representation, Muslim MPs could get about 10 seats in the parliament, which is a big thing. And with the 10 seats, they started bargaining with the corrupt Sinhala politicians. What, what do they bargain? The Muslim fellows will get two ministers, two sub-ministers, sub and ambassadorship. That's all. They are not going to solve this Muslim problem. Now, Muslims themselves becoming part and parcel of this so-called corrupt system. And the emergence of these Muslim political parties have added further tension into the political schemata. Meaning that when you have ethnic parties and they start bargaining with the Sinhalese politicians, it becomes a huge issue. I cannot, in a, uh, a few minutes I can understand, I cannot explain to you how uh, these intersymbiotic issues work between the ethnic parties. But I will say even Sri Lankan Muslims are partly responsible for the Kwagnaya, they are now going in. It is not totally Sinhalese politicians to be blamed. The Muslims themselves indirectly becoming a collaborators, part and parcel of this movement. Now, how long is I good? Five, five, ten more. Okay, right. Well, I think because I know the subject so well, I could speak up. I understand how much things would go as American students. But before ending, I only want you to understand, in order to understand the political science and the system of governments in our countries, the Sri Lankan system is totally out of tune with what I witnessing in America. America, I shouldn't say this thing. Whatever you say, there's an organization here. There's a bureaucracy. There is justice. People queue up. People are patient. Most of the time, they're honest. Every, even a, I, I've seen it. Every little thing, reasonable. But imagine contrasting a situation. People will jump the queue. People try to snatch for themselves. People try to take your advantages to their advantages without any heart. That is a system Sri Lanka has been now going through. And that is what is creating all these problems. So how do we solve it? Now, if I'm a political leader, what will I do? What will I do? Now, this is the question I'm interested. Well, first thing is Sri Lanka has three major communities, namely Sinhalese, Tamils, and Muslims. To me, all these three communities have to call us together. No way. You cannot keep out one community and develop the country. Because all these people have their special skills. For example, in 1983, after the famous anti-Tamil riots, the real Tamil intellectuals, doctors, engineers, business people left the country en masse. And they went to Canada and settled in Australia. The real brain of Sri Lanka exited. Now, same things happening to Muslims in, the, in my part. Our Muslim businessmen who have a lot of money, 
had invested in a lot of businesses, they don't want to do any more business. They're taking all their money and moving out to a country like Indonesia and Malaysia. Imagine that situation come. So Sri Lanka is losing a big part of their capital as much as they lost a big part of their brain to the other countries. So a nation cannot, cannot progress without this. And Sri Lanka should understand that historically and politically, they need to stay as a multiracial, multipolitical country. All the communities must join together. They have to make many sacrifices in order to bring up the whole country as a group. But how, do, how is it possible? That is why currently Sri Lanka parliament is trying to reform the constitution. The constitution is one of the worst place where they wanted to establish dictators. Like, for example, what they did to uh, Hitler. The constitution, with the Sinhalese majority, they brought in the constitution to create a leader. But that leader totally failed. Imagine a guy who got 70% of the votes, Sinhalese, and he had to run away from his seat within two years. So the majority is not a panacea for, for political stability. So now Sri Lanka has understood this whole system of the constitutional rights had to be changed. So now they are bringing a lot of amendments to the constitution. We call 22nd amendments. There's a lot of resistance because that constitution, when you introduce, there is certain amount of justice going to take place. And uh, there must be a lot of independent commissions like ability to employ judges independently, public servants independently. In other words, the government should be separated from personal interest. The government should run by the, by the bureaucrats. So Sri Lanka is now trying to overcome these ethnic issues and political issues and the corruption issues by fine-tuning the political system. I don't know how far it's going to be true. There's a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance to that because the corrupt lead to more corruption. But I'm sure um, if things can continue the old way, Sri Lanka is going to undergo a big revolution, which means, as I just told you, we might turn into another Cambodia. Because there are people, extreme leftist-minded people in Sri Lanka, who believe in the old Marxist system of one person to one. So they might reintroduce without worrying about America, without going for money from IMF, without um, seeking capital from outside, they would try to use the local personnel and resources in order to rebuild country. That is one scenario. So lately, the current president who is sitting there, I will rather say, not legitimately, he was just selected by the parliamentarians to become president. He is trying his best to avoid the situation and appeal to people to, to, to what you call uh, be calm and help his mission to achieve political stability in the country. So I think uh, as a final words, I would say from the student point of view, from political science point of view, Sri Lanka is ideal ground, <laughs> ideal case study to see how ethnicity, politics, and religion mix in a bad way, in a bad way. So that is the lesson as American students you'll understand. Understand, I suppose when you people come to Sri Lanka as American scholars, workers, you will understand very clearly what I'm trying to say and you can avoid these pitfalls. I wish well my, to my country, being a Muslim, I will maintain my identity, whatever happened, I'm not going to be Sinhalese and these people cannot bulldoze me. We will have our own traditions, culture, our mosques will still continue. Of course, we are losing our privileges very recently. We cannot build any more mosques. We cannot build any more madrasas. We cannot marry the way we want. 
So there are going to be lot of restrictions, lot of restrictions, which is inevitable in a way. So today when I say the Muslim Isla living Islamically, meaning we have to live in a country with much less power and freedom we enjoyed before. So the new Sri Lanka is not going to be the same Sri Lanka. The minorities like Muslims and Tamils have to accommodate quite a lot and learn to live in a what you call tolerant way. I think I made it enough. I'm sorry if I had confused you. The problem with us is since I know the subject and I'm there, I may be able to rattling on from my perspective, and you people may not know the condition, but I suppose I have opened up a little bit. You may now realize things. But don't go with the impression Sri Lanka is that bad. Eh? Please visit Sri Lanka. You will enjoy. It's a very lovely country. Very lovely country. And people are very nice. Very nice. You are welcome there. And you are safe. No Americans have ever been killed in Sri Lanka. <laughs> no, never. Yeah. yeah. So, it's a very safe country. I think I feel secure in uh, Sri Lanka, then I'm secure in America. Only last week I was nearly mobbed by a Chicago mob. I tried to take a bus. <laughs> want to understand how the buses travel, and I went into the wrong part. And then I, the bus stopped because somebody has vomited in the bus. They put me down. And you know, four guys surrounded me. And I was having a camera like a tourist. Then uh, they asked me where I'm from. I was smart. I didn't want to tell Sri Lanka anywhere. This is the end of it. We have seen in uh, Hollywood films how they smash up old people <laughs> for the for the thick of it. You know what I said? Luckily, I saw a police car quite far. Then they asked me where I'm from. I said I'm from the State Department. What are you doing here? I'm trying to understand because I wanted to prove that I'm I'm a sort of government man, and that saved me. Had I did not use my Wit, telling <laughs> where I am, what I am, I'm, I can tell you I'm gone. They were ready. And they said, people who understood said, this is at the end of the medicine road, the bad area. I've never seen such areas. Of course, Harlem, I haven't been. My gosh, this is America, I was wondering when I went there. People are digging from the dustbins. I, I got films here to prove that point. It's a very, very poor area. And I, and I did not mean to get down there. I was put down there. And then this is what happened. So immediately these guys came like flies to me. And unfortunately, I had some money in that, on that day from purse. I mean, this is very dangerous. And uh, just to conclude, one of the Sri Lankan Fulbrighters like me, this happened in Washington. Some lady tried to ask money from him to eat. He went to give $5. He was immediately taken into the car. And all his money was taken. This, uh, what do you call, the credit cards were taken and he was thrown out. So Fulbright people were very upset when, you, when they heard that. I said, you never do this adventurism anymore, doctor. Just st stay where you are. What I'm saying is, the, the, in my country, I can be very sure that unless it is so bad, nothing of this can happen. You are very safe. You are welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful lecture and uh, introduction to uh, Sri Lanka. Um, Let's open this up to uh, Q and A. Um, you mentioned that it was like inevitable that certain concessions would have to be made um, that the Muslim population would lose certain rights. Do you ever believe that eventually? Uh, Sri Lanka can achieve like uh, a more equal state, or do you think it'll def like more likely go down the path of uh, Cambodia, Pol Pot, all that? I, I I I I tend to believe if the current status quo of unable to manage economy, we are we are in doldrums. You know what I mean? Economy is very bad, right? And people are starving and hungry. And nothing more powerful in the political world than Hungary, like what happened in the French Revolution. So you see, if that can happen, 
the whole system can collapse and we don't know where it will lead to. That is the answer to that. I'm not talking about Cambodian model, but the present parliamentary model cannot last. And what model is going to come? There are extreme leftist groups are there waiting to, waiting to come to power. And they will carry out bulldoze. And there's no place for intellectuals like us. You see, uh, that's what I'm going to tell you. This is, this is high possibility. In Sri Lanka, it can happen, not in India. India still have a very strong bureaucracy. Whatever the government changes, Indian bureaucracy would work. In Sri Lanka, bureaucracy itself has collapsed. The, the public servants are corrupt. The lawyers are corrupt. I'll tell you one example. Yesterday, what happened? In Sri Lanka, central bank governor, 15 fellows have robbed the bank, central bank, robbed. Meaning they sold what you call, what do I call, bonds, bond. They made advantage to one of their sons-in-law. It's a very major scandal. Sri Lankan lost billions. Yesterday, all the 20 fellows were released. No case. No case, just yesterday. Bond scam, we call bond scam. Sri Lankan money lost. And now see, so I wish that something could happen anymore. So another problem we have to worry about justice, justice system. So it's, it is everywhere. It's corruption right through. Yes, I don't want to be very, uh, what do you call, prophet of doom, by the way, but they had need to do something. There are a lot of people who think like me that we had to smarten up before we get to us. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. How do you see the rise of uh, ethnic and religious extremism in uh, Myanmar uh, related to Sri Lanka? How do you see if they do you see if, uh, them as related or um, under any kind of uh, possibility? Very good question. Very good question because Sri Lanka tried to model from Myanmar. Myanmar, there was a monk, the famous monk, who has created a hell of a lot of problem. He was brought to Sri Lanka as a chief guest in one of those extremist parties. And you have to understand, Buddhist, historically, Myanmar and Sri Lanka share the same tradition like Theravada Buddhism. Theravada. So they are on the same line. But vis-a-vis -vis the minorities, the Muslim minorities in Myanmar is far worse state than Muslim minority in Sri Lanka. That I must tell you. There are Muslim minorities like in Thailand, 7%, Myanmar. They are not better off. But since you asked that question, I will say, Sri Lanka has tried to model Myanmar, but it didn't go very far. Very interestingly, now you saw the clip I showed you, that Buddhist monk is a hard guard. He wanted to destroy this thing. You know what's the latest? I didn't tell you. He was bought over by Saudi Arabia. Imagine, Saudi Arabia would never take monks into their country. Rob, yes, but he was brought there. And Saudi Arabia had their national day celebrated two weeks ago. And this monk was the chief guest. So what, what does it indicate to you? Now they are trying to handle it indifferently. Rather than going confrontational, rather than going to punish them, they wanted to see that in an amicable way, they can bring them into their fold so that further trouble will be avoided. Otherwise, this particular monk I'm telling you, the founder of the extremism, today doesn't talk against Quran, doesn't talk against the prophet, doesn't talk against the law. So there's some change is taking place in some area. One question is from outside. Basically, I'm from India and Kashmir part of the India. So, a few months before, Jay Vardhan, you were president for like two Maldives. And you were just talking about the constitution, reformation in the constitution. How you can compare Muslims in Sri Lanka and Muslims in India, basically from Kashmir and India and Sri Lanka? What are their position in common and what are their position in different? The, the Common positions between Sri Lankan Muslims and Indian Muslims are much same. Meaning that they are day by day they are losing their, their power of existentialism. No, because just like I have one news today, just one of the member of parliament comes and he gives the hateful speech at the stage and he's not being prosecuted. Same is the case in the, uh, Sri Lanka or it is worse or it is good as Same, same. 
Now, I, because of my limitations of time, I didn't want to go there. The hate speech is very, very common in Sri Lanka. Hate speech, just like uh, in uh, in India. Actually, there is a parallel situation for the Muslims, both in Sri Lanka and India. I will rather put it in a general way. There's not much difference, ma'am. They are Hinduism, here Buddhism. Both are using the religion to to keep them in power. BJP and. Uh, no, that is uh, one question. My question is basically the Muslims, not only Muslims in Sri Lanka, but Christians in Sri Lanka, because Christians are in 7.1 and Muslims are in 7.6. What is the difference between the two? Both are treated the same way or there is difference between the two? No, actually in a way they are treated in a somewhat same way. For example, they have a lot of anti-Christian things. They go and destroy the Christian temples. They, they are afraid that Christianity is spreading and they are trying to convert their teachers. But not as bad as uh, not as bad as the Muslims. What happens is when you say Christians, they are also Sinhalese. The Sinhalese are Buddhist and Christian. So they are within their own, within their own game. So the, the, you will not see the contrast between the Christians and Singhal, the Buddhi, Muslims vis-a-vis -vis the Sinhalese. Meaning Christians are not that bad off. Although they too have issues in terms of propagating their religion. Yes, sir. Um, so you presented like two different perspectives in the way, um, in terms of the corruption, that on one hand you were saying that the people themselves have a lot of ethnic hatred and that politicians are taking advantage of that. And then on the other hand you were saying that politicians are actually using that hatred and projecting it downward. Which one do you think is more damaging and which one do you think would be more valuable to tackle the problem from? From the perspective of politicians projecting the hatred downward or the people projecting the hatred? The thing is that you have to understand, you poison the mind of people, poison, poison, just like what happened in the Nazi Germany. You know, you tell lies over and over again, that become truth. In Sri Lanka, politicians and the singular people sometimes can go hand in hand. They, they believe them, what they say. I told you, I haven't, I got some more clips of the riots. The Sinhalese people in, on the street easily fall trap to a little bit of incitement and anti, anti rhetoric, anti Muslim speech. So, when you talk about anti-Muslim, both the people and the political leaders are in the same platform. Who manipulates whom is a question to answer. We still have time for a few more. Yes. Uh, this is a follow-up to my previous question. So you mentioned that the uh, Myanmar model didn't really work both in Sri Lanka and you could argue in Myanmar. Do you believe something along the lines of the Indian model, which you said had a far stronger bureaucracy, could be applied to Sri Lanka? Or do you believe the problem's more rooted in the attitudes of the people and needs more like eh, educational reform or something like that? No, I'm telling you, more need to be done, sir. I, I don't want to be very uh, pessimistic about it. The whole thing has to be rerouted, restarted. You cannot go with what, what you have now. Sometimes I feel, I believe I am not a leftist going into that kind of extreme situation. It's very difficult with the current system to change people's mind. Because if it's like a crab mentality. Do you know crabs? Do you know about the crabs? The, when the crab trying to go up, it will bring it down. Ten, you put 10 crabs, they'll come. That is the situation in Sri Lanka. Meaning that everybody tried to pull it down each other, they tried to forward each other. Very individualistic, what do you call, selfish. And uh, very, the so-called intellectualism. Few people who think rationally like us, the number is slowly coming down. We, but we have a group, we are powerful. We, we, we advocate it, but how far we can go? We need to be more populist. You know, there's a big difference between intellectual populist. They call us very armchair politicians. We can tell good things, but the actual, if you go to the ground, the reality is different. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. There's a, a perception amongst Americans that the thing that makes this society, this government, different from so many others is that it is one that is based on protecting and serving the 
ordinance of a constitution versus that of other organizations where people right, are driving it, are following a person, and that person then has control over the military. Do you feel that in our conversation about what lessons we can learn and how we can compare the United States to other nations or stories, right? The United States is very young still. Is the demarcating principle this commitment to the ordinances of the Constitution, or are those just as easily unstable as what we're witnessing in other countries? No, you are taking extreme examples of UN example, the U US example. It's very ideal. But if you understand, wherever the U.S. has gone in, um, people don't trust. They will, the, the so-called uh, promotion of constitutionalism, democracy, is always one-sided. If it is going against the interest of the U.S., this won't work. Take, for example, Saudi Arabia. I have been in uh, Japan in a think tank where CIA was operating. I was a member of that. They were coming out with these things. The, the US policy is good. I mean, I would love to have US way of thinking, democracy, etc. But then it serves to that point where US interests are served. If you go against them, that's it. They will just throw them away. I mean, I mean you, there are a lot of books written about these things. It is not the ideal model, ideal model. But nonetheless, United States always promote democracy, democracy. Right? That's one of the samples, but not round, they don't talk too much because there are other things happening in the world. You see? But in the 70s, 80s, if you know, they were going all out to these countries to, to, to uh, uh, impart, imbibe the ideals of democracy. Am I right? But now, now they don't talk much about it. I don't know. So is it, it democracy that keeps us how we are? Or is it or is something else? No, it's a quite democracy. Ability to, ability to work from the bottom up. That uh, you, you have representative institutions. In, at every level, take the university. Uh, deans operate separately. You don't need everything to come from the top. This is one thing I found about uh, US. People operate in different groups and satellites, and they're all responsible for the actions. In Sri Lanka, it's not like that. Everything has to flow, flow down from president to the minister. Everything in the minister has to come. You see? But here, one of the best systems here is independence, ability to act, initiative. Take, for example, the immigration officials. They have full power to do what they want. You see? That, that goes with the fact that they have to be extraordinarily honest. Of course, there are some black sheep are there. But overall, US trusts the honesty part of the individuals. And they go away. This is, this is one of the lessons I've learned after coming here. Individual action, individual honesty, to try to be. I had a bad examples here. I go to Walmart, Walmart, the huge queue, in between, there's a gap. I don't know what, I thought, oh, this is the best thing I go in. My gosh, I've been pulled down like anything. I'm not following the queue. But, uh, sorry, I didn't see the queue. Queue separated by the walkway, you see. Now, this has uh, taught me there are some other issues. For example, uh, <laughs> quite a lot of my Sri Lankan character has changed here. When I go back, I will follow America example. I'll see, inshallah. <laughs> well, we have time for about one more question. Anyway, I just want to ask, one of you can tell me, was I confusing too much? I just wanted to see whether, no. I wanted to see whether I have passed my message. But this is a, it's a very huge subject, sir. This number of articles and books are being proliferated. I have, I have reduced it. I have a bad habit of reducing things rather than expanding. And I, had I spoken to a, say, professor group, I would have spoken differently. I don't need to go into the details. But in your case, I wanted to make it simplified. Thank you. Join me in thanking Dr. Bachar.